to dislocations of the elbow. So uh, I'm going to talk about understanding rotatory fracture dislocations. And by these, we mean those injuries where there's a coronoid fracture and a radial head fracture and a subluxation or dislocation of the elbow. My name is Jody Fadness. I work in Brighton uh, as an elbow surgeon in the UK. So the real emphasis on the talk is going to be about discussing the pathoanatomy of these injuries, how we can recognize what pattern of injuries occurred and how this influences our decision making and, of course, management principles. We know that the uh, primary elbow stabilizers are the collateral ligaments and the coronoid, but as Anand just uh, pointed out, in an injury where the MCL is um, injured, the radial head becomes an important secondary and primary stabilizer to restore stability, and we have to respect these bony and soft tissue stabilizers when we're fixing these injuries. So the forces that um, are imparted to an injured elbow are a combination of axial load, varus or valgus moment, and then internal or external rotation. And we're talking about rotation of, uh, in the axial plane of the ulna relative to the distal humerus. And we can have external and internal rotation. And it's this combination of forces that gives us two broad patterns of injury. One is a posterior lateral pattern of injury, where there's valgus and external rotation, and one is the posterior medial pattern of injury, where there's predominantly a varus and internal rotation injury. And discerning which of these injuries has happened um, can be performed by looking at the bony injuries that have occurred, with particular reference to the pattern of coronoid fracture, the, the shape and position, and whether the radial head is fractured or intact. And the pattern recognition uh, will then infer which so associated soft tissue injuries are present and need to be repaired. Of all the soft tissues that always requires repair in these fracture dislocations is the lateral collateral ligament, which acts as a hammock to cradle the radial head and also provides varus and external rotation stability, which I'll demonstrate for you. And it's injured in both posterolateral lateral and posterolateral medial patterns and needs repair in both. This is the consequence in the posterolateral lateral pattern. It causes this external rotation stability, i.e. a drop sign. So on the lateral view, you're seeing that because of the detensioning of the lateral collateral ligament, we've got the uh, owner, the owner rotating away from the humerus and then in the posterior remedial pattern, we get this varus instability where there's a, a sleeve avulsion of the lateral ligament, allow it, causing coronal plane instability. Well, on the medial collateral ligament um, is responsible for valgus stability of the elbow as well as internal rotation. And the internal rotation stability comes from the posterior part of the MCL and the valgus stability comes from the anterior part of the MCL. The anterior part tends to be ruptured in the valgus patterns, the posterior lateral instabilities, and the posterior part tends to be ruptured in the posterior medial pattern, the internal rotation. But we often don't need to fix the medial collateral ligament because in most circumstances, the common flexors are intact and they compensate well for this injury, unless they are all also evolved as in this uh, picture on the right. What's the role of the coronoid? Well, obviously it has a role in sagittal plane stability of the elbow by perform, uh, providing an anterior buttress uh, to subluxation, but it's also important for coronal plane uh, stability. And the key part of the coronoid is this anterior medial facet where, which resists various forces. It's also important for rotational stability, so it resists internal rotation, but what you'll note is that the tip region of the coronoid doesn't actually provide significant stability. Coronoid fractures are classified according to the O'Driscoll classification um, um, nowadays, and this is a CT-based classification. And the importance of this classification is it emphasizes the role of the anterior medial uh, coronoid instability as well as the basal um, coronoid fractures, which are large, and it emphasizes that the tip fractures aren't that important. We characteristically get this concave 
um, defect in the medial trochlea, and this can extend either into the sublime tubercle or into the tip region, but it's the anteromedial part we're most concerned about. And this is because the anteromedial fractures are associated with this fairly malignant type of instability called the posterior medial varus instability pattern. Just to recap, when we have an internal rotation force to the ulnar humeral joint and a varus force, we get this varus and internal rotation subluxation with tearing of the lateral collateral ligament and a classic anteromedial coronoid fracture, which is concave shaped because of uh, because of the uh, trochlea driving into the coronoid. And the posterior band of the MCL is the hidden injury that we can't see. This can be seen or inferred on static radiographs where you get this delta type sign widening of the um, lateral joint line. And remember, there's a lateral collateral ligament injury. I mentioned that this is particularly uh, a malignant type because this chronic posterior medial varus subluxation can lead to rapid arthritis in some situations. And when, and when this occurs, the, there aren't many options for treatment, one of which might be a total elbow replacement. So do all of these coronoid fractures need fixing? Well, clearly not. So what we want to know is that which can be treated non-operatively, and are there situations where we can just treat the lateral ligament without repairing the coronoid? So this biomechanical study suggested that all subtype 3, i.e. fractures involving the sublime tubercle and those fractures that were 5 millimeters or more in height off the anteromedial coronoid required fixation and then smaller fractures um, could be treated with ligament repair only. This clinical study from Spain also demonstrated that fractures involving um, the sublime tubercle needed fixation if the joint was incongruent on imaging, it needed fixation. However, many fractures with uh, congruent joints and smaller coronoid heights could be treated successfully um, non-operatively. However, in some of their patients, they had poor results, and that was because of lack of lateral ligament uh, stability or repair. This is a study that we performed in our institution, and again, the message is that if the, if the sublime tubercle is fractured, uh, that coronoid needs repair. However, if you have a congruent joint reduction, a smaller size coronoid, and negative varus and posterior lateral draw test, then you might consider treating this elbow non-operatively. And if the posterior lateral draw test, which is designed to look for lateral collateral ligament um, sufficiency, is positive, then you might repair the lateral ligament alone. And we found by looking at our cases, that if the coronoid was more likely to be um, fixed or needed for fixation if the fragments were bigger than 6.5, which fits with the previous work of um, five millimeters as potentially being a critical size. This is the posterior lateral draw test I mentioned. So it's used for diagnosing lateral ligament insufficiency. And if I find this in a patient work which I'm considering non-operative treatment for, I will go on to fix the lateral ligament. The varus stress test. This is essentially trying to provoke subluxation of the trochlea into the coronoid deficiency, and it manifests as either radiographic evidence of this, or more often you feel grinding and grating or locking of the elbow through passive and active motion. So, if you're going to go ahead and fix the coronoid, we can use arthroscopic techniques or open techniques. But I'd urge you to avoid and move away from thinking about fixing these with sutures. Essentially, these sutures don't give a rigid fixation and they're only used for smaller fragments to capture the capsule. And I've already demonstrated that these small tip fractures don't actually need fixation. So arthroscopic fixation, while this is uh, uh, not something that most people would do, um, if you have the arthroscopic skills and you have a coronoid fracture which is fairly large and in one piece, I do use this technique because it avoids the morbidity of the medial approach um, that can cause ulnar nerve problems. And so it, it is a valuable technique in the, in the correct hands. More commonly, you'll be thinking about open approaches. 
and we tend to use uh, medial approaches for this as it allows access to the whole coronoid, it allows access to the medial collateral ligament um, for repair, and it allows plating and screw fixation that aren't possible through a lateral approach. Well, Anand's already discussed the role of the radial head, so I won't go through this too much. However, um, it's important not to excise the radial head in a fracture dislocation situation because we know that this will alter the, the loading of the elbow and will, will result in earlier onset arthritis. And then discuss the ways of um, fixing uh, the radial head already. And he's also mentioned um, radial head replacement and just emphasize the critical point of radial head replacement is correct sizing and length. Getting the head size, um, it, the way to do this is use the less the diameter of the radial head. Remember the radial head is not round, it's an oval shaped stru uh, structure and you want to use the lesser diameter of it in order to prevent um, overstuffing. Length is the other important point and I've found um, the best ways to re reference intraoperatively the lesser sigmoid notch, which we can see here, the radial head shouldn't be proud of this, as I found x-ray measurement to be unreliable. Remember alignment, the radial uh, neck and head alignment is not collinear to the shaft axis. It actually should be aligned with the axis of forearm rotation, which lines up with um, the radial tuberosity distal aspect and the ulnar styloid. This is what happens with overstuffing. You get jacking out of the lateral uh, joint line and, and persistent subluxation. So just finally, let's conceptualize what I've discussed about um, these fracture dislocations into a column theory where the medial column of the elbow is the coronoid and the anteromedial facet. The lateral column is the uh, radial head and the capitellum and the less important central column, the anterolateral facet, the coronoid. If you think about this as a structure that's supporting a roof with your lateral collateral and medial collateral ligaments, when we have a simple elbow dislocation, we know that we tear the lateral and collateral ligaments. However, 90% of these are stable because we have that roof and the two and all the columns attached intact. If you have a terrible triad type situation where we have an anterior lateral fracture of the coronoid, the, and the roof remains stable because we've got the medial and lateral column intact. If we introduce a radial head fracture, we're going to get instability of the whole joint and we have to restore the uh, roof by restoring the lateral column, whether that be through fixing or replacing the radial head. So you might think, why do we uh, emphasize the lateral ligament um, in repair? Well, this is a two-dimensional uh, image, and we have to think in three dimensions. Remember that the lateral collateral ligament is important for external rotation or supination instability. And if you're thinking in the axial plane, we have to repair it to restore this rotatory uh, stability of the joint and the lateral column to restore the coronal plane stability. Now let's move to the anteromedial fracture. Well, if we have a small anteromedial coronoid fracture, we'll get subluxation, which is the posterior medial pattern of injury I demonstrated. But in the smaller fractures, we can do a robust lateral ligament fixation and give ourselves a stable roof. In the more, uh, more severe coronoid fractures, where there's a larger fragment, we'll get persistent subluxation that the lateral ligament won't account for. And these are the ones we have to fix the coronoid, fix the lateral ligament, and potentially fix the medial ligament. So just finally to touch on some of the adjuvant treatments that we might use, um, the three techniques that we, we could use are internal bracing, the internal joint stabilizer, which is, is a new device, and external fixation. I'm a big fan of internal bracing, especially for either very big uh, arms that are heavy or where the soft tissues are shredded or you have bifocal tears, we can add an internal brace, which is essentially um, a synthetic suture, either with two anchors at the insertion and um, origin of the ligament or a, a, a proprietary internal brace technique. The internal joint stabilizer for me is a very clever product 
And I do use this for potentially revision situations or situation where there's gross instability. An external fixation really is an extremely rare uh, construct to be needed if we follow the principles. And I reserve this for infection with instability or vascular injuries. How do we rehab these patients? Well, all the things we've talk, talked about should allow um, immediate motion. So we should be fixing or replacing the elbow in order to allow immediate active motion. Um, I do protect the patients and stop them from doing uh, putting rotational torque through the elbow uh, and various forces, but I don't tend to use any bracing or splinting. And a supine rehab program that utilizes gravity to compress the joint and early active movement to utilize the dynamic stability of their muscles, what we are after. So summary messages, think about the pattern of instability you're dealing with. Um, you can do this by analyzing the coronoid fractures carefully, as well as whether there's a radial head fracture or not, and tailor your surgery to the individual injury. Don't use one technique for all. And remember, in all these, injuries, you're going to need to repair or treat the lateral collateral ligament and never excise the radial head. Thank you for listening.